I'm so glad to be able to welcome you to church this morning. If you're new with us, then an especially big warm welcome to you. Um, please reach out via our contact details. Let us know that you're out there because we would love to connect and get to know you. Um, but yeah, now let's just get our hearts ready for worship. Um, I just wanted to share a little passage from this book that I read a lot. Um, and um, so this is called The Cat Lady. And um, I think that it fits quite well with the sermon that we'll be hearing today. So that's why I'm reading it. She comes every night as the sun is setting. From where I sit in the woods, I can see her on top of the hill. She is silhouetted behind the setting sun. Her clothes and hair shine with the brilliance of that dying light. She comes to feed the forest cats. She lightly hits a pan with a spoon and she tosses handfuls of cat food onto the forest floor. The cats come from all directions with their tails raised high, almost perfectly straight. They're cautious. They move slowly toward her with hunger, but she only has good to give. She loves the cats and she understands their ways. She has names for them all and watches for sick or missing ones. I've seen her search for an uncounted cat. When I see the cat lady, I think of God who comes to us only to do good who seeks us out in ways we are hardly aware of. The features of God are hard to see, lost as they are in the brilliance of a light that is spread over all the world. Out of the light comes care and food and names and searches. We approach to be fed and even cared for, and then we run back into the woods of our lives satisfied, only to return again out of our need for what God gives. And the Bible verse that goes with this is Luke 11, 11 to 12. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? So, yeah, just reflecting on the idea that, or on the truth that God knows us and searches for us and loves us, and has good, caring, loving gifts to give us this morning. Let's come together in worship. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall.
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I will fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. So I will. I am uh, Chase, and I'll be leading the community prayer. So if you'd like to just uh, bow your heads, uh, if you want, you don't have to. Uh, I can't tell. Um, so if we could just uh, be respectful and just do whatever uh, makes you feel well, then we'll get started. Um, Lord, thank you for um, our community. Thank you for um, everyone around us, either listening or not listening, um, that you would just bless them individually and bless their household, that you would be uh, with them through this time. Um, may you just continue to be um, our foundation um, and what keeps us strong and what keeps us steady, Lord, um, that you would continue with us. Um, thank you for um, our leadership, not just in our church, but um, in our city, in our province, in our country, that you would um, continue to keep them um, steady and strong as well. And lead us um, not just uh, emotionally with what they say, but help lead us into stronger and um, fulfilling um, just their roles in your plan, God, that you would just continue to lead us down that path. Um, thank you for um, everybody um, at Camp Emmadine, that you would continue to help them through this time. In opening um, new day camps, weekend nights, um, that you would bless everyone volunteering there and keep them healthy, keep them safe through this time, God, and you would just uh, breathe love and life into our lives. Thank you for our community um, and keep us uh, vigilant and strong through this time, God, that although we are not seeing each other in person, um, we will stay loving and strong together. In your name, amen. Thank you very much. A reading from Luke 15, 11 to 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. 
So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Greetings, church. Such an honor to be with you again today as we look at the third and final message on our series on the prodigal son or the prodigal sons. Uh, last week, we left off with the younger son returning home and being met by father. And the same day, the father throwing a huge party on behalf of the son. Grace doesn't waste any time, does it? But not everybody puts on a party hat. Look at verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Wow. There is some real tension that's building in the story. I want you to picture the scene, if you will. The Mediterranean sun... Think of a Vincent van Gogh painting, setting, casting its very long shadows uh, on the older brother. He's now silhouetted. He's coming home after a very long day's work. And somebody might be asking, why is the older brother uh, working so late? And he would tell you that ever since the younger brother left, he's been doing the job of two men. He is filled with bitterness. He is tired. He's hungry. He's an older brother with, with low blood sugar. That's trouble. And he's thirsty. And as he gets closer to the large home, at the center of this massive estate, he hears what sounds like the pulsating rhythm of a drum. And then he hears over that the higher notes of a tambourine. And as he gets closer, he can hear the music the instruments, people singing, and he can see through the window into the courtyard, people dancing like Jewish people do, lots of people. It looks like the whole village is there, and he smells something cooking. It certainly isn't pork, but it's not goat. He smells something that he hasn't smelled cooking for a very long time. He smells beef. For whatever reason, the father has killed the fattened calf. The house is just pulsating with pleasure. It's interesting because when he left home that morning to go work in the field, his father didn't say anything about throwing a party that night. Something must have happened during the day to justify such a reckless expenditure of money. He doesn't go in. He immediately questions the justification of such levity. Verse 26. So he called one of the servants, or more accurately in the Greek, he called one of the young boys and asked him what was going on. The only responsible brother in the family needs to know what's driving this celebration and why he wasn't consulted. 
Kenneth Bailey again helps us. He says, these young boys comprise part of the anticipated crowd that the prodigal feared as he made his way home. Now, though these boys are not inside, probably too young to receive an invitation or to be on the guest list, they still all know what's going on. Parties like this are not thrown willy-nilly. They either witnessed the reconciliation between the prodigal son and the father, or they heard about it. But news like this spreads fast. So everybody in town knew. The young boys who weren't in the party, they knew. Verse 27. Here's what the younger boy says. Your brother has come, he said, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has come back safe and sound. The last phrase could be translated, because your father has received him with peace. So the boy's statement is pregnant with meaning. In effect, he's saying, your father has opened his heart to a sinner and is now dining with him. Remember, this is the context of the whole reason why Jesus told these three parables in the first place. The parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Remember how the chapter begins? Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered to themselves, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So that's what what stimulated or provoked the teaching in Luke chapter 15. There's a huge implication in the young boy's answer to the older brother. The implication is that your father has received this younger son with shalom. In other words, all the broken, shattered pieces of this young brother's life and of the relationship between him and the father has now all come together into one God-glorifying whole. <laughs> because that's what the word shalom means. The father has received his son with shalom. Things have been broken, but they are now whole again. And without sufficient time to even test the sinner's sincerity, the father and the rebel are reconciled. Otherwise, they wouldn't be eating together. How does this make the older brother feel? His opinion was not consulted. The father has not first waited for the older brother to come home. I mean, why didn't he throw the party the next day or on Friday night? No, the older brother's opinion of the whole thing has not been heard. His wise judgment has not been consulted, and he's outraged as a result. The father has simply made a unilateral decision, and the older brother is angry about it. So now, this is the part of the story where it's the older brother's turn to completely humiliate and disgrace his father. Yes, the younger brother did it years ago. But every kind of son and daughter has the capacity to wound father. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him to come in. What's going on in the heart of the older brother? I mean, he knows that he's the legitimate heir of all the wealth following his father's death. Hosting a meal of this magnitude is, is really within the rights of the father to do if he wants it. He's still living, and the estate is still his. But let's be honest, the older brother is seeing his future bankroll diminish. Perhaps you've seen the bumper sticker on vehicles of retired baby boomers like me. We're spending our kids' inheritance. <laughs> well... The older brother is ticked off that the father is spending his inheritance on somebody who doesn't deserve it, on the younger brother. But there's way more going on here than just money. This isn't really about materialism. The reinstatement of the younger brother violates the village honor system. Where's the justice, cries the older brother. Where's the necessary humiliation? 
Where's the payment? Where's the reconciliation for crimes committed? Somebody has to make restitution. Show me the money. Half of the estate was blown on prostitutes. Show me the money. Who's going to pay for this? And for many of us, this idea of grace flies directly in the face of our deep sense of justice. It's just not fair. And so some of us, you know, we, we learn to say that very young as a three-year-old when we see that our five-year-old sibling is getting something that we don't get. It's not fair. And as a teenager, we're still singing the same song. It's not fair. <laughs> Mom and dad are giving me something that I don't have or that I'm not ready for. It's not fair. And then as an adult, we keep saying in our heart quietly, it's not fair. And on our deathbed, some of us are saying, it's not fair. We still have the heart of the older brother. The fact is, somebody does need to pay. But what the older brother can't see and doesn't want to see is that it's not the younger brother who's going to pay. It's the father who's going to pay. And the older brother is not ready for that kind of grace. It's the father who chose to bore the young prodigal's shame and humiliation. The father in embracing and forgiving the younger brother is a picture of God in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, taking the initiation for that reconciliation, running towards the sinner, and paying the entire price for the reconciliation to happen. For once, we were alienated from God and were hostile in our minds because of our evil behavior. But now he has reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death to present us holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. Powerful. We call this justification by faith. Grace alone through faith alone. By not going into the party... The older brother deeply insults his father. We would say, uh, using theological language, he insulted the spirit of grace. That's how the writer to the Hebrews puts it. And it's ironic that as one broken relationship is being healed inside the house where the party is going on, father and younger son, another relationship is imploding, the relationship between the father and the older son. All of this is happening during a public banquet. Everybody sees it. And for the second time in one day, the Father once again graciously deals with sin. For the second time now in one day, the Father reaches out in love, endures the shame, initiates the reconciliation. He doesn't demand it. He doesn't force a party hat on the older brother's head. He doesn't jam a drink into his hand and say, come on, I'm commanding you to enter this party and start to have fun. No, he knows that love doesn't work that way. You cannot force love. You cannot force grace. He entreats, pleads, begs. He says, come on, son. But the older brother answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. <laughs> In these well-known words now, the older brother's heart is fully exposed, isn't it? My heart is fully exposed. It's interesting that in all three parables, the main characters or the people in power are all the ones who initiate the reconciliation and do what, what is needed in order for the reconciliation to happen. The woman who owns the coins, she's the one that goes after the lost coin. She turns the house upside down to find it. The parable of the, the shepherd with the lost sheep, he leaves the 99 sheep in open pasture 
and risks everything to go find the one lost sheep and brings it home on his shoulders. The person in power does all the heavy lifting. And in the story of the prodigal sons, it's the father, the person in power, who runs to the son and clothes him with his righteousness. He initiates this new relationship of forgiveness and reconciliation. The only person in power in the three stories who doesn't initiate grace and reconciliation, the only one unwilling to forgive, is the older brother. You see, he's in a position of power too, but he wants to hang on to his power. He wants to go the way of the dragon, not the way of the lamb. There's only one direction the older brother is willing to move, and it's the direction where he maintains control of his life and his money and the farm, where his heart cannot be cracked open. He's not willing to take the paschal journey to the cross. No, the Via Dolorosa is not on his agenda. He's blind to it. He's blind to his heart's true condition. He too is a rebel. He's just like the younger brother. He just doesn't see it. This is a dangerous place to be. The older brother's on the farm, but he's lost. The older brother's still living at home, but he's lost. The older brother is still employed. He's still sitting in church, but he's lost. It's terrifying. He may be physically close, but spiritually, he's thousands of miles away like a married couple sharing the same house but living completely independent lives. The older brother is simply a joyless law keeper. He's Javert in Les Miserables. He's an angry man. He's hateful of everybody. He's hateful of his brother and his father. He's hateful of all the partiers. He appears hopelessly narcissistic. Is there any hope for the older brother? He says, you've never even given me a goat to celebrate with my friends, and now you throw the mother of all parties for this reprobate. If you remember, we were quite hard on the younger brother when he was writing his speech to manipulate his father, suggesting that it would be better for him to simply be a slave and no longer a son. We were hard on him for that, but the older brother now is doing exactly the same thing, only worse. He doesn't see himself as a son either. He sees himself as a slave who's worked hard and has earned certain rewards, certain brownie points for good behavior, and he doesn't think that his father has come through. He says, I've been slaving for you all these years, but you've never come through with your end of the bargain. The older brother feels completely entitled. Again, it's ironic that the woman who finds her lost coin doesn't need to justify throwing a party. And the, the uh, shepherd who risks everything to find the one lost sheep doesn't need to justify himself for celebrating either. It's self-evident. The thing that's been lost has been found. But how sad that the older brother demands justification for the celebration of his brother's homecoming. In this parable, Jesus is making a point. He's lampooning the Pharisees. He's saying that the younger son represents the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners, and they are coming into the kingdom before the Pharisees. The older son represents the Pharisees who demand that Jesus give an account for why he's, he has all these welcoming relationships with sinners. Where does the parable speak to you? Who are you in the parable? Let me share a couple closing thoughts. One, an observation that I've made over the last 40 years about church people, people like us. And secondly, an observation that I've seen in me and where I stand in relationship to this parable. I think the one thing that holds most Christians back from really pressing into know God and moving forward in their spiritual formation is that their concept of God is preventing it. 
Like the older brother, we view our relationship with God more like a contract. That we work hard and the Father rewards us for good behavior. We don't see our relationship as a covenant of love that was initiated first by Father. We believe that God honors good behavior with a good life, and in typical older brother style, we naturally believe that we have been sufficiently good. <laughs> Unlike the younger brother, we, the older brothers, have stayed in church at least. We tithe, we serve, and we've avoided most of the very bad sins. And as a result, though we've never said it out loud, we really do believe that God owes us something. And this attitude is really only exposed and seen publicly when we experience a loss of some kind. Cancer attacks. We lose our health. Or a child dies, tragically. Or a marriage dissolves. Or a job is lost. Or education is forfeited. Or a nest egg diminishes or early dementia sets in. There's a lot of things that happen to us in this life that are very, very painful. And the attitude that often emerges out of the older brother's heart is, what have I done to deserve this? Why me? Where is God's faithfulness to me in view of my faithfulness to him? It's a common response, but it reveals that we view ourselves not as sons and daughters, but as servants. And if we've learned anything from the gospel, it's that sonship always precedes servanthood. The story before us that we've spent the last three weeks looking at, instead of condemning us older brother types, offers grace to us and forgiveness and the possibility of very real transformation. But receiving the grace will involve an accurate self-assessment, gratitude instead of ingratitude, humility instead of pride, which leads to repentance. A painting is going to come up on the screen, and the painting really illustrates what God wants to do in the life of the older brother. You can see that the father is in the middle of the painting and the younger brother is on the left. He's just been welcomed and embraced by father. But the older brother is on the right of the father. His face is turned away from father and the younger brother. In one hand, he is waving a flag. He's crying, foul, this is wrong. Somebody has to be held to account. And you'll see he's still thinking about the young goat that was never given to him. The, the, the goat is blue, and it's on the path. It's below his arm. He's just completely hung up with stuff, stuff that he deserves and didn't get. And notice where his other hand is. It's in a clenched fist, and it's coming up towards the face of the younger brother. As long as the older brother's fist is clenched, there's really no hope for him. He needs to open it up and invite the grace of the Father into his life. You know, for me, I'm definitely the older brother. I have a younger brother. I also have a younger sister. I'm also a father of two sons, older, younger, and I also have a daughter. <laughs> Lots of family dynamics. My, my brother and I love each other. I love him and he loves me, but it's, it's been a difficult relationship for many reasons. We lost our mother very young. I was 13 and he was seven. Six years ago, I was back in Calgary where we were both raised. And while I was there, I revisited my adolescence and really began to see that the way I had treated my younger brother was just so wrong. What he needed after my mother's death was a nurturing relationship with the older brother, but I didn't give it to him, and I felt very convicted about that. I confessed that to him one night over dinner. 
The other thing is that when my younger brother hit his teenage years, because he didn't have a mother anymore, he had a stepmother that was a challenging relationship, and because I was now a, a, an older teenager and not present, my dad was on the road, he basically had to raise himself in many ways, and, and he acted out. He acted out like much like the younger brother in our parable. And I stood in judgment over him. And I did not treat him well. And I confessed that as well to him that night and asked for his forgiveness. And what I have come to see is that probably all of us tend towards younger brother rebellion, the rule breaker, or the older brother rebellion, self-righteousness and judgmentalism. Some of us are both. But both are met at the cross. The father is seeking the hearts of both boys, of both daughters. Both are estranged from God. He's saying to us, everything I have is yours. Receive it. Wherever the Lord may be speaking to you through these messages and this very well-known parable, why not turn your face towards the Father? Let him look at you, embrace you, love you, and begin the process of healing you and restoring your heart towards him and towards others. This is the power of the gospel. May this be true for you and for me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Yeah.